transgenic pigs, cloned sheep, cotton that resists insects, tomatoes that last longer, cows that produce more milk. They're already here. It's what may be coming in genetic engineering that has everybody watching. Why? Because DNA controls all life, and we are learning to control DNA. That means we can alter life directly. Our environment, our health, and even our evolution as the human species will possibly be changed by genetic design in the foreseeable future. At the center of this revolution is the science of recombinant DNA. DNA codes for proteins, and almost every one of life's processes is run by proteins. If we can figure out the gene or genes which code for the protein to control a particular feature of life, the term used is phenotype, meaning the observable outcome of a gene, if we can figure out the gene that controls the phenotype, then we have the means to change it. We can switch it off or on. And if we transplant that gene to another organism, which never had it before, that organism will then show the phenotype too. It's possible because, with very few exceptions, the genetic code is universal. What the DNA means in one organism, it also means in any other whether it's an animal or plant or bacterium. And it has done so throughout all of evolution. The idea that you could use the genetic code to recreate a dinosaur is quite valid. That's true, but right now we're a long way from that. The entire genome of an organism is millions upon millions of base pairs long. So it's too big to use in one piece. We have to cut it up. And that's where this stuff comes in. In fact, genetic engineering all began when we first isolated this stuff. This is an enzyme which cuts DNA. If I mix this with a solution of DNA, it cuts the long DNA molecule into smaller pieces wherever it sees a particular base sequence. This is EcoR1, and it cuts where it sees the base sequence GAATTC. It's called a restriction enzyme, and these are some of the others. They all cut DNA at different base sequences, which are called their recognition sites. Most restriction enzymes produce a staggered cut across the double helix of DNA, leaving matching bases exposed. This means that the end is left sticky. It's attracted to any end with a matching sequence, meaning any other end cut by the same enzyme. But as long as it's cut by the same enzyme, it could be the end of a completely different piece of DNA. This is how we take the gene from one piece of DNA and put it into another. First, we cut out the piece of DNA containing the gene that we want. Then, we cut a gap in the host DNA using the same restriction enzyme. We now mix the two together and the sticky ends attract the foreign DNA into the gap in the host DNA. Of course, this is just base pair attraction. The backbone of the helix hasn't rejoined yet, so if I let it get too warm, the pieces will just fall back away from each other again. To rejoin the helix, I need to add DNA ligase, the enzyme responsible for zipping up the helix when it copies naturally. And voila, I now have spliced in the extra piece of DNA. It has recombined, which is how this technique gets its name. Of course, it's one thing to play with extracted DNA and recombine it, but quite another to get foreign DNA into a cell and have it integrate with the cell's DNA in such a way that it works, copies, and doesn't disrupt other genes. How is that done? Surprisingly, it can be as simple as this. The gene gun shoots foreign DNA straight into the host cells. Some of it works its way into the nucleus and the cells express it as if it were their own. Disadvantages are that this can be physically damaging to cells 
and where the DNA ends up in the host's genome is random. More commonly, the foreign DNA is spliced into the DNA of simple organisms like bacteria or viruses. Bacteria do not have a nucleus. Their DNA is contained in a single circular chromosome. But they can sometimes pick up extra DNA through their cell walls directly from the environment. So sometimes there may be within the bacterium extra DNA called a plasmid. Plasmids are very useful. We can use them to carry new DNA into the bacteria. With only 2,000 to 6,000 base pairs in a plasmid, there's usually only one recognition site for a restriction enzyme to cut. When a new gene is spliced into a plasmid, it can usually go into only one position. Thus, the small size of a plasmid gives control over where the new gene goes in. But when recombinant plasmids are mixed with bacteria, only a few of the bacteria take one up. So which bacteria are they? Well, often, plasmids also contain antibiotic resistance genes. By adding an appropriate antibiotic to the culture, all the non-resistant bacteria are killed. The only survivors are the bacteria carrying a copy of the plasmid, which, of course, also carries our new spliced-in gene. So, what's the point of inserting a new gene into a bacterium? Take a simple example, diabetes. If you have diabetes, you'll know all about insulin, the hormone which enables the body's cells to take up sugar. The sugar glucose is our cellular fuel. If our cells cannot absorb glucose from our blood, we will literally starve in the midst of plenty. Diabetics cannot produce enough of their own insulin and need regular injections. Without insulin, they develop a voracious appetite and thirst. Yet they still can waste away and die. Diabetes affects up to 4% of the population. When insulin was discovered, it had to come from places like this, extracted from the pancreases of calves and pigs. Animal insulin is close enough to human insulin to work but it can have bad side effects, and it's not cheap. Then in 1982, insulin became the first substance to be genetically engineered on a commercial scale. The human gene for insulin was spliced into E. coli bacteria, and they expressed the exact protein. Real human insulin is made in culture tanks like this, by billions of bacteria. It has become cheaper and more readily available. Insulin is just one on a list of human proteins that have been produced by bacteria using recombinant DNA. Obviously, this is a list of substances that are greatly needed and which were expensive and hard, if not almost impossible, to get before. But researchers are moving beyond the manufacture of proteins in this way. Using muscle cells, they have inserted the insulin gene into these cells in their early experiments and found that little bubbles of fluid containing insulin were manufactured, but the cells could not secrete the insulin into the circulation. Next, the liver cell was used, which has far greater capability. The liver cell can sense glucose and make the right amount of insulin to match that glucose level. Gene therapy using liver cells in this way offers the real hope for a cure for diabetes in the future. Gene therapy holds much promise for a number of diseases, especially those with a genetic cause. A case of real success is the disease cystic fibrosis. Caused by an inherited dysfunctional gene, cystic fibrosis results in an unusually thick and dry mucus in the respiratory system. With worsening lung infections, the patient often dies before they reach 30. 
One approach has been to insert the functional gene into a harmless virus and to have the patient inhale the virus as a spray. As the virus infects the lung tissues, inserting its DNA into the lung cells, the recombinant gene goes along with it. It starts to produce the needed protein and the disease is, hopefully, cured. Problems include the fact that as cells of the respiratory lining die naturally and are replaced, the new ones do not always contain the required gene. So the cure may slowly be lost. And because the body is programmed to resist infection, further applications of the virus may not be so effective. So a gene therapy that works permanently has not yet been achieved. A particularly thorny case is cancer. Cancer is definitely a genetic disease because it involves cell division. Cell division is caused by oncogenes switching on. In mature, non-dividing cells, oncogenes are switched off. There are also tumour suppressor genes, which can put the brakes on cell division. Cancer involves all these genes failing, and the cell divides uncontrollably. The main problem for gene therapists, even if they have a gene which will shut down the dividing cells, is cancer's spread. Once cancerous cells reach the bloodstream, they can migrate into all areas of the body. It makes treatment very hard. The only effective genetic method so far has been direct injection. But you can't go around the body sticking a needle into every place where the cancer occurs. While it may not be a cure for cancer, there is one sure way, however, to get a new gene into every part of the body. Put the gene into the first cell of the unborn. Put it into the fertilized egg or the seed. Then, as this zygote divides and differentiates, the new gene is automatically cloned into every tissue of the organism. This is germline therapy, and it's where we came in. Over the centuries, people have selectively bred plants and animals to improve their yield, to make them grow faster, to be resistant to disease. This is traditional biotechnology, and it is germline DNA manipulation, even if farmers didn't know it. But it is indirect manipulation, and somewhat hit or miss, because crossbreeding drags lots of genes around. It takes generations to perfect. Recombinant DNA has three advantages over traditional agriculture. It's much more precise, it's quicker, and it can do something that no traditional breeder can do. It can cross the species barrier. Recombinant DNA technology has put insect resistance from bacteria into corn. It has created goats which secrete spider silk in their milk. From pigs to soybeans, many farm products are undergoing field trials for some kind of genetic improvement. But how are the genes chosen? What else can genetic science do? And what about the issues? Should we allow germline therapy on human beings? Recombinant DNA is far from the end of the story. For a custom copy of this program, contact ABC Commercial on 1300 650 587 or visit abc.net.au slash program sales.